Um, just to go over the agenda today, as you can see, we're going to just um, talk a little bit more about what some of these uh, lessons are with, with Naomi Gaking from Impact Investors. Thank you, Naomi, for being our um, esteemed moderator. And, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll let Monique have a, a moderated panel discussion. So maybe we'll go ahead and start, Monique. Um, I'm curious to hear thoughts on essentially what you saw happening last year with um, impact investing and investment in general, and where you think that might um, take us this year in 2021. Sure, and thanks for having me. Um, you know, I have a unique position in the marketplace because I was um, a program director at Mission Investors Exchange, which pulled together a lot of programming and peer learning for folks in impact investing space. Um, a lot of foundations and other, you know, outcome focused uh, actors. And I also sit on the editorial board of Impact Alpha, one of the key digital news magazines for the sector. And by virtue of that kind of bird's eye view, there are definitely some trends that we saw as a result of what was being funded and where folks were we're talking about in terms of at the meta level, where should we go now, given all that we've seen and the systemic failures that the pandemic made obvious. So it, there was a couple of trends, um, renewed focus on basic funding, or base, funding basic needs, I should say, and financial wellness and inclusion and the importance of those kinds of things in our economy. Really the awareness of the fragility of our system and the need for greater resilience, coordination and collaboration in order to be more effective. Accountability and transparency came to the fore. I think um, that will be a key word of the year, hopefully, the accountability aspect for 2021. But at a big picture level, stakeholder capitalism, I think everyone's talking about it in a new way. The convergence of the policy side, the investor side, um, the real economy, and the shift to potentially impact primacy. Impact Alpha characterizes that as impact on. We all need greater and more effective outcomes. So what does that mean for how you do your work, whatever kind of actor you are? As we focus, generally speaking, on the importance of policy as the backdrop and in the United States, the importance of uh, dem democratic systems to enable the rest and getting to scale. Our problems are deep, vast, and global. So those solutions that have been incubated in some spaces, uh, grants did get into the R&D phase and all those kinds of things, we have seen what has worked, and let's 10x it, as they say, in Impact Alpha. So those are some of the things that we saw in terms of trends. Um, and if I will just roll right into your 21, 2021 question, what did we learn? Systems are fragile. We learned who is truly essential. Racial justice work is not separate from other kinds of work. It's at the design phase. And we need to leave behind siloed thinking in terms of themes and tools, and I just do this one vertical and address this one thing. And we need to ask in much more coordinated ways, while that is more difficult to achieve, um, that leads to more durable change. So this radical, radical collaboration that we need now, um, I think it's something that we really need to think about, and the intersectionality and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary of it all. Housing is healthcare, poverty alleviation, conserved children can address gender lens concerns, homelessness. So, you know, how do we get out of thinking of things as a vertical and think across? As well as the last point I'll make is modern slavery. I think um, that's something that is invisible that we often don't talk about much, but this is the year, I think, 2021, as we think about things that percolate through a system and create systemic risk and also systemic extraction and, and um, Marginalization. I think that's one thing that we need to call up in 2021 and really think about again. I think um, there's so much in all of those points that you mentioned. We would probably have a, a session on each one of those. Um, I know some of the key topics that you just mentioned might be new phrases or maybe unfamiliar to some of our audience members. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how you define um, in your work stakeholder capitalism and also um, some of your thoughts around the, the resilience and what you, how you did that. Sure, and I will certainly leave it to our panelists as well to add a little more color on those things specifically. For the stakeholder capitalism question, I think that is a reaction to shareholder capitalism, which many might be much more familiar with. 
whoever owns the shares, and we're doing everything in service of those owners. Stakeholders capitalism recon recognizes many more actors as key to, you know, potentially a company if we're talking about that, but really an economy. So who else? The workers, the customers, the planet, our resources, the supply chains, all of those things are stakeholders in the success factors of the economy, but also who are the stakeholders at an individual organizational level, whoever it might be, whether it be a philanthropic institution, a company, uh, large or small. Who do you serve? Who works with you? Who partners with you? Who works for you? All of those are the stakeholders that we need to be mindful of, that um, the decisions that we make are in service of all of those actors having successful outcomes and people thriving at the end of the day. Great, thank you. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started and um, I look forward to learning more today. Thank you. Thank you. And I think this is the point where we bring Dr. Gillian Michelle into the conversation. She is a senior leader in economic development and international business with a proven track record of attracting investment to emerging markets. She leads Resilience Capital Ventures, LLC, an advisory firm in the blended finance space. She is a thought leader, well-respected in the impact space with a particular focus on diversity and inclusion, racial equity, accountability, and alignment with SDGs. Dr. Marcel has extensive experience in both the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa and has trained as an economist at the University of West Indies in Trinidad and the Keele Institute of World Economics in Germany. She's got an MBA from Georgetown University, George Washington University, excuse me, and a doctorate in science and technology policy from SPRU at Sussex University. Dr. Jillian, we invite you to the conversation to share your perspectives and insights gained from decades of lived experience, and we'll love to hear from you now. Thank you, Monique, and good morning to everyone who is on the webinar with us, and thank you very much, uh, Sasha, uh, as a team leader for this, this effort. And I want to, um, if, if I could bring up the first slide, what I'm going to be talking about um, uh, in my mini presentation picks up very much from what um, Monique has uh, started us off with, because I'm going to be speaking about how we can, in fact, think about the development challenges and the private sector development challenges by actually moving beyond finance. And so that might sound a little strange, and hopefully in the five to seven minutes that I have to set up some of these fundamental assumptions, I will have not only got your attention, but convinced you in, about the argument. So if you could bring up the next slide. I am coming to you uh, with these propositions, having had some 30 to 32 years in both finance and development and currently lead a small capital advisory firm uh, that is active in three domains. So we provide uh, advisory services to funds, we provide advisory services to ventures, and the work that I'm doing today with you is part of our advocacy where we actually speak about the system behind the finance and development uh, effort. Next slide. And this is where I want to spend some time for a few moments, and you will have access to this presentation, so uh, no need to worry about some of the details. But the main point that I want to make by focusing on systems change, as Monique rightly said, the efforts and the challenges that we are encountering in 2021 and that we've encountered in such a dramatic fashion in 2020, take place at a systemic level, which means that there are interrelated processes that need to change. But for a moment, I want to actually not talk about the structures and the institutions, but I want to use the recent example of the US to make a central point that at the heart of a system, and for those of you who are interested in sort of um, uh, getting more information about this, you might want to ch check out Douglas North, who speaks about the invisible aspects of institutions. And I think in the last few weeks in the United States, we have had a very visible demonstration that, in fact, 
the mental models that are at play in any system are perhaps more important than the structures and the institutions. Because when those mental models shift, the institutions and the organizations and even the people in those systems behave differently. And so the contention for what I'm going to present to you is that the mental model operating in the finance and development world has not caught up with reality of how the world is currently uh, structured and shaped. And more importantly, it has veered away from its ethics. And so the move to stakeholder capitalism is a nudge in that direction. But I think folks like the Pope and other uh, religious leaders, uh, this is not a religious presentation, but it's about ethics, uh, speak to the fact that we have veered in late stage capitalism very far away from humanity and planetary stewardship. And so therefore, the work at Resilience Capital Ventures, and we are a small, tiny firm providing knowledge capital, is to, in everything that we do, remind both our clients and in uh, sessions like this one to, to, to make an intervention into the world so that we can shine some light on where is the most important lever for change. And I want to focus on mental models. And so if you could go to the next slide. In order to do that, we actually, which is why I'm so happy to have accepted this um, invitation, we celebrate the private sector as one important lever. But we celebrate the private sector not in an ideological fashion. We celebrate the private sector because we believe that private sector enterprise is actually very important for the shift that we're trying to make. And why I emphasize that we're not uh, particularly ideological about this is to tell one small anecdote. When I led a private sector development team uh, dealing with post-conflict reconstruction in Liberia, I included market women among the private sector actors. Now, that might have surprised some people. I must say that President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf understood it because the market women had survived the 27 years of civil war. They were an institution that actually showed more resilience than some of the other institutions. And yet, if you had asked someone else with a different set of notions and assumptions about what constitutes the private sector, those market women would never have been included. And so I have to, again, it's a long time ago, it's in 20, 2007 that I did this work at the IFC, but I must salute my colleagues and my reporting managers for being willing to shift boundaries. Next slide, please. And so several years later, bringing what we know from 30 years of practice, bringing what I know from my academic work as an, as an innovation scholar and as an economist, we have actually defined an approach to the finance and development challenge, to the developmental challenge that we think is actually an advance on what currently exists. And I'll read uh, what, what is central to this proposition. We believe that the development finance uh, community should be deploying investment strategies that moves, mobilizes, and then deploys financial capital in combination with other forms of capital, knowledge capital, political capital, social capital, cultural network, and relationship capital. And we believe that because it is those forms of capital, not debt, cash, or equity, that can actually address the challenges in mental models. And I go further to make another point, because often, you know, having been a financial practitioner, and I suppose I am one again, but I've also been many other things. Finance professionals are usually A-type personalities. 
They believe that they know everything. They believe in numeracy above other forms of expression. They are often very narrow and reductionist. And so they believe that they know the answers and all they would need to do is to get some what's typically called technical assistance to make the enterprises where they're going to uh, deploy financial capital investable. We are here to say that that is completely wrongheaded, completely wrongheaded. And as evidence, I provide the fact that that mental model has been in existence for some 70 years. Everything since post-World War II assumes that technocrats, usually white men sitting in Washington, D.C., London, maybe Zurich, have the answers for developmental challenges. That mental model has left us with a $2.5 trillion gap for financing the SDGs. And usually, I would just say, and so, should we actually still be discussing whether that mental model works? But it's not that easy, because that mental model also has the airwaves, media, large firms, and all of the tools of incumbency. As an innovation scholar, I understand that dominant design is strong. Dominant design requires intentionality to make change. Tiny firms like Resilience Capital Ventures are here to make a change because we say emphatically that the existing mental model has not worked. It has not worked to mobilize capital for development. It has not worked for planetary stewardship. It certainly has not worked for diversity and inclusion. And with the Biden-Harris administration coming in, the finance and investment industry should be on notice because with 4.1% of people of color at decision-making levels in the U.S. finance and investment industry, it means that they are now six times less than the administration for which uh, that makes political decisions. And so 2021 has begun with a seismic shift because the mental model about who has value, what kinds of knowledge is important, not only for representational purposes, but also because of the knowledge represented by those communities. If you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll wrap up in, in, in two minutes. And so the Triple B framework speaks to the need to actually address bottlenecks, of which we believe there are three main types, structural, processual, and cognitive bottlenecks. But as I've been saying for the last five minutes, we believe that the cognitive bottlenecks that are at play in the finance and investment industry are by far and away the most important bottleneck to be addressed. And that bottleneck shows up as a blind spot where Folks who have $7 trillion to deploy in the private equity or hedge fund environment needed to be convinced that they should actually take gender equality into account. Folks that have a sovereign wealth fund need to be convinced that there is something about the portfolio in terms of making sure that you have geographic diversity. What explains that other than a mental model that is skewed, a mental model that is not open, a mental model that would deny a pandemic, <laughs> a mental model that would not look to other parts of the world for examples of success stories, a mental model that is actually deeply flawed. And so our approach to finance goes far beyond cash, debt, equity, first loss dollars, 
catalytic finance because we say even if you had all of the financial capital, all of the worldly treasures, and you were deploying them using that flawed thinking, come September, during the General Assembly, we would go through the same ritual of saying, how are we going to fund the $2.5 trillion gap in the SDGs? And so our work, as a small capital advisory firm based in, in Washington, D.C., and working, as Monique said, in sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean, is to find opportunities to work with funds, to work with DFIs, who are bold enough to be the likes, as Amanda Gorman reminded us to do. Be the light. Challenge these places of darkness. Because the planet, and humanity actually depends on us finding courage, not only to experiment, but courage to actually find solutions that, quite frankly, make more sense than what we're doing right now. So I'll leave it there. There are some more slides in the actual presentation, and I know that we're going to have a discussion as well about where have we applied this framework, what sort of successes we've had so far, and what sort of opportunities are exist for getting this kind of thinking to penetrate more widely. Thank you very, very much, and thanks again for the invitation. Well, that was fantastic, uh, Jillian, and, and we just have two quick questions before we bring in Dr. Claudia Mitling to the conversation. And so here, I just want to ask, how has this framework been received? Certainly, it's elegant in its, um, you know, just putting the problem together with some really core Focus on levers, how to get the solutions out of this vast, complex problem set that we have. So how has it been received by fellow practitioners, and how do we begin to do differently as a result of this awareness? Thanks again for that excellent question. I think um, we are the first ones to put our hand up and acknowledge very proudly, though, that it is complex because the problems that we're trying to solve are uh, actually complex. And so in our work, uh, if I give an example of where a triple B framework has been applied, not necessarily because a particular client says, yes, I believe in the triple B framework because it doesn't work that way. Um, I've been involved in assisting a large German investment management company to raise capital for renewable energy in the Caribbean. Caribbean is the region that is in dire need of that kind of financial capital. And one of the issues that showed up as a bottleneck is that uh, the capital raised prior to RCV becoming involved, it didn't actually know about the entire financial landscape. And so I am proud to say that I was able to open that up, shine some light on the fact that the credit union movement in one single Caribbean country has assets under management of $2 billion U.S. dollars. And because of my relationship capital with advisors who manage large credit unions and the ability to speak to those credit unions in a language that they understand, they actually came in to a private equity fund. And up until we got some more institutional capital, uh, their $5 million investment was actually the largest single investment in the entire fund. And so that's one example of where the triple B framework has been applied in, uh, in the Caribbean. We are a young uh, company as well. We've been around only for two and a half years, you know, building on the 30 years of other things that I've been doing. And so I would say that um, that uh, experience gives me hope as well as you know, the countless um, discussions, talks, and advocacy efforts on uh, these issues, which is particularly in the last quarter of 2020, there were many, many, many invitations to speak about our work, and we certainly um, welcome those. Thank you, Jillian, and we'll we'll come back to you in the Q and A that's uh, together with Claudia when we end here, but. Uh... To make sure that we have time for Dr. Claudia Manning, 
She's an investment principal at SASME Fund and has more than 20 year career in development finance, including at the Development Bank of Southern Africa, among other posts along the way. Uh, Dr. Manning has a DPhil and MPhil from the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex and earlier degrees from the University of Natal. So not to belabor any longer, uh, Claudia, would you like to come join us and share with us a few thoughts before we get to a few specific questions for you and then some collective discussion with, uh, with Jillian? Thanks so much, Monique, and, and thanks for your remarks, Jillian. Um, I completely agree with, with, uh, with your uh, position and perspectives on so many of these uh, problems that we have in finance. So, so I am uh, an executive at the um, SA SME Fund, and um, we are in fact a public-private partnership. We emerge out of um, an initiative that was started about three or three and a half years ago, um, and it was a attempt by the South African Finance Ministry and the large corporates in South Africa to figure out what can we do about uh, trying to accelerate investment into small businesses, into innovation, uh, and into, uh, into transformation uh, so that black entrepreneurs would be able to access finance. And what eventually emerged was us as the SASME fund. We're a tiny fund. We're basically a $100 million fund. Um, and what we have tried to do is to direct capital to entrepreneurs who have traditionally really, really struggled to, to access to access finance. And and just to just to draw the link with, with some of the comments that um that Jillian made, we, we we are completely of the view that um the the the, the best mechanism to move the needle in a country like South Africa is where you draw upon the expertise of the private sector and uh, the, 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 the responsibilities and, and, and powers of government in the form of public-private partnerships to be able to actually get things done. And so our shareholders are 50 large corporates, the uh, Public Investment Corporation, which is the um, uh, pension fund for government employees. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, deployed the fund uh, pretty much completely in the last couple of months. Um, we've invested it into uh, uh, 13 fund managers. So we're effectively operate as a, as a fund of funds. Um, and we've, we've uh, invested in a combination of debt funds, equity funds, and venture capital funds. And we, we are um, at the moment, in the process of raising a new uh, fund for venture capital funds, and we do so. If we just go down to the next slide, we may have a, we may have a slide uh, that will talk a bit more about what. Yeah. So, so, so our uh, what we've attempted to do is to is to build an asset class. Uh, in the venture capital industry in South Africa that is it, at the moment almost, it's not non-existent, but it's in its real infancy. And the, and the problem that, that we have there is that if, if there's no investment or capital available for early stage businesses, we're cutting off the lifeblood for innovation. And, and, and sadly, I mean, South Africa has, as I'm sure many of you are, are fully aware, a very sophisticated capital market, and yet we have this very uh, glaring gap in that early stage businesses, and particularly early stage black businesses, have very, very few doors on which they can knock in order to access this capital. And so you're stunting uh, potential innovation, potential growth, and of course the transformation of, of, the, of the economy. And so, so we, as the South African, uh, the SASME Fund, have become South Africa's largest institutional in, investor in, in venture capital. And that's not because we have a huge amount of capital, but simply because there's so little uh, of, of it around that, that our small investment, you know, of probably $60 million, you know, into, into VC has, has become disproportionately large in the overall sort of scheme of things. Um, we, we are 
very, very conscious that we, we sit at the cusp at this stage as we are about to raise the new uh, VC fund, um, that we, we are potentially creating the, the strength, the legs and strength for a new class of, of, um, of, 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 of capital that is going to be structured in what we think is an innovative way that brings together all the best principles of public-private partnerships. So we are investing um, some, some capital from, from the current fund, our current shareholders' capital. Um, we have secured uh, an investment from USAID um, of $2 million into the fund. We're expecting the South African government, the Department of Science and Innovation, hopefully to invest probably $10 million. Um, where we are we are intending to raise from the private sector as well. But what we've done to try and uh, uh, um, entice very nervous investors into this asset class is to structure it in a way that makes it the most attractive and remove several layers of risk. So we have created a, a, a class of, ca of capital in the fund called First Loss Capital, which is provided by our, by our current shareholders as well as by, by USAID. And so what that does is that it allows investors who are quite nervous about, the, about investing into early stage businesses to come in knowing that we as First Loss providers will lose our shirt before they lose any money. And, and we think that that's, a, that's a, an incredibly important role that USAID has played. And in all of our conversations with these fairly nervous investors, in particular pension funds, when, you, when, we're, when we're in a position where we can say, listen, we have first loss capital, we have USAID um, you know, providing a, a tranche of capital that's de-risking uh, this, this, uh, this new VC fund, so, so it, you know, it just makes the conversation that much easier. And so, so it speaks to some of the points that, that, um, that Julian was making, which is that we've got to be innovative and think differently about how you, um, how you, you know, attract investors who, you know, are, are, have a mindset that just doesn't work in this way um, to, to get them to think about how one can, how one can structure uh, funds in, in an inclusive way to, uh, to, broaden, uh, to broaden the impact, uh, and in this case, to create a new asset class that in hopefully 10 years' time will be considered a, you know, run-of-the-mill, you know, asset class that, you know, without thinking, uh, asset consultants will say, absolutely, venture capital provides returns, but in addition, it provides impact, it has a transformation uh, a role in society. It it um, it empowers women fund managers, black fund managers in the South African context, and provides incredible impact. And and that's the last point that I that I will make, which is that we we found that in our in our portfolio companies um, that that our fund managers have invested in. If you look at, at the at the kind of of investments that they have made, they are not your typical Silicon Valley uh, uh, VC portfolios. I mean, the the phrase that we like to use at, at the fund is is that it, investing in in um, in South Africa and in Africa uh, in venture capital is investing in impact. And if we look at at the at the at the at the choices and the decisions investment decisions that our that our fund managers have made they speak to investing in pretty much a substantial portion of the SDGs in health in in education in clean energy um, in in transformation in terms of of gender and 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 color etc and so we we are we are fairly confident that 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 by deepening uh, and widening the venture capital industry in South Africa, which is where our fund is is exclusively focused, unfortunately. Um, but but that by by doing so, we will in fact be able to demonstrate that investing in VC is about providing success stories in the impact space. That really is good for emerging economies and economies all over, where where people you know have have SDGs that still need to be met. So so that's. That's, I think, where I will I'll, I will stop, Monique, and, and you know, happy to have further conversation. 
Just a couple quick questions for you before we get into a broader discussion. Uh, what changed about either your strategy or what you've seen as a result of COVID uh, to the small business sector? So, so um, the, you know, the South African um, financial sector is, a, is an unusual one for most developing countries in that we've got a mature banking system um, and we have, I mean, large institutions, high degrees of, of regulation, um, and, and, and very well respected uh, financial institutions. What we found is that obviously, as in everywhere in the world, small businesses were disproportionately impacted by, um, by, by COVID. And what we also found very unfortunately is that they were not getting access to capital. And, and it wasn't for any sinister reason other than, as in many countries, um, the large financial institutions are not your typical bankers of small businesses. And, and so they, they are, they, for, for, I mean, we, we could, I'm sure, have an entire seminar about why that is the case. But, but the reality is that um, they are considered to be too risky. Um, they, you know, the, the, the regulatory compliance requirements are just too onerous for them to, to deal with. They often don't have the security that the, the banks require, et cetera. And so we had a very, as a country, a very, very large program that was made available, a, a sort of a bailout package by the, by the National Treasury and the Reserve Bank. And we found uh, within a couple of months that, in fact, none of it was, very little of it, rather, was getting to, to small businesses. And, um, and what we also realized is that the non-bank uh, financial institutions were actually the principal lenders to the SMEs. And so we, we have fortunately in our portfolio three of those um, that we have supported uh, who are able to, to, um, you know, to, to provide uh, various forms of funding, debt and equity funding for small businesses. We did attempt to, to create a new fund, which would be backed by, by, uh, by government. The timelines didn't work, um, the usual bureaucratic difficulties that one has with government, and so we were unable to proceed with it. But, I mean, the lesson that we learned is that unless we have uh, institutional support, DFI support for the non-bank lending industries, and I'm sure the South African experience is one that you know, applies to many other countries, that unless we get that element right, we are going to continue to neglect a really, really important uh, a segment of the of the economy, which in most countries employs upwards of sixty or seventy percent, you know, of the of the of the labor force in in any one country. So so we've got, we've got to get we've got to get better at 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 providing support for the non bank financial institutions. Thank you for those uh, responses there, and then it really kind of brings me to our roles changing of these various actors that we talk about we need in these blended finance transactions as we think about um, development and funding SDG. What, what needs to change about some of these partners? Um, we'll actually bring in Jillian to respond to that as well, but we'll start with you. Uh, in the South African context, you actually have experience working at the development bank and some other places, and you've seen and been party on, on various sides of these transactions. So as we think about roles now, how they might differ from before, you know, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on, on those elements and, and what might need to be shifted. So, so the, 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 the one concept that I find to be very valuable is the concept of catalytic capital. And, and what we've seen uh, in our fund um, and, and we've, we've seen in the new fund that we've raised and in many of the fund managers that we've backed is that um, when you can find a public sector or DFI partner, who has the wisdom, the foresight, um, the, the, the mental mindset, as Julian calls it, to be able to understand why creating a new class of capital, a new market, whatever it is that, that, is, is try, that we're trying to, to, to build, that if they can get involved often with very small amounts of capital, they can draw in other capital providers, other institutions who may not get the concept of what we're trying to, to, to build, but we'll get the comfort from having 
the, the presence of these DFIs or, or government institutions, but also the structure of, of, these, um, of these transactions, which often have the, the capital, the capital provider taking a different risk role and, um, and perhaps uh, structuring the reward profile in a way that benefits the more sort of nervous or, or antsy so who's, who, you know, who typically isn't, uh, you know, isn't willing to, to you know, to invest in, in, in this new market or in this new class of capital. And, and I think that, I think the DFIs get it. And, and I mean, we, we are hugely appreciative of the, of the work that USA did on, in, in our, in our new fund. Um, we need, we need to, you know, I think we need to strengthen that amongst the DFI community broadly and, of course, um, you know, um, amongst uh, governments as well. Um, Jillian, I think I'd love to hear from you. You were nodding along and I saw some comments in the chat. What's your take on, on this point as well? Um, what needs to change in terms of these evolving goals that we need for now? Okay, so yes, you did see me nodding. and. Although I don't want to turn this completely into a South African um, discussion, uh, the example that I will give is also from South Africa, because uh, exactly 20 years ago, a company that is now um, one of the largest telecom companies in, on the planet, but certainly one of the largest telecoms companies in, on the continent, won a license to develop uh, telecommunications in Nigeria, and their share price dropped 10% on the day that they won that license. And I say this because that illustrates that even in a sophisticated uh, capital market like South Africa, because this was a listed company, if the perception of risk and reward is not well understood, so the South African buy side analysts believe that MTN winning a license in Nigeria would increase their risk profile. And they didn't factor in the rewards that would come. <laughs> so at the time, I was an equities analyst at JP Morgan, and I made my reputation on being the biggest bull for the Nigerian market, because obviously, <laughs> obviously, the Nigerian telecoms market was going to change the face of Africa and telecommunications. And I say that that's where knowledge capital comes in because I was doing my doctoral work on African telecommunications. So JP Morgan understood that they needed to back my view. And so several billions of dollars later for JP Morgan and all of my clients, that knowledge translated into rewards. But the point becomes somebody also has to have a view and back it. <laughs> because even if you are able to mobilize 100 million, 1 billion, and no one has an investment thesis, a philosophy, an understanding of why and how can we invest that capital in ways that produce rewards. We're not supposed to be coddling the private sector. And yet, that's what I had to do. At 2 o'clock in the morning, I would have clients calling me up, are you sure? I was like, trust and make the call. Buy the stock. <laughs> right? And they did. That guy who called me up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and he made enough money that he set up his own uh, boutique investment bank. So my point being that you have to have, there is no substitute for backing, having a view, having an investment thesis, backing it, backing it also with the kind of resources that a bulge bracket investment bank like JP Morgan can. Not everyone has those kinds of resources. But when you back it, then see it through. Because part of why we don't create value from these SMMEs is that we don't see it through. We don't uh, take the investment into the post-investment phase. And I want to give a shout out to some of my colleagues on the continent, uh, people like Diana Gichacha from Kenya, where her, her focus on post-investment support has already been producing 
re results because even if we mobilize the financial capital and then we deploy it, we still have to create value over time. And so I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of how and who needs to get involved, but in a sense, what do we need to do and how do we need to understand the investment process as being pre-investment, deployment of capital, and then post-investment? Uh, absolutely, and I think it's interesting because the venture sector in the United States believes in wraparound services. So it's it's sort of odd to under, to for that to be a surprise. But when we think about risk and how many ways we miss price risk because we see risk in turn, through the lens of these mental models that you shared that look like the wrong way that I view what is risky and what is not risky. And we think about the term that we think is um, sort of an independent fact of finance and the numeracy that you, the numeracy primacy that you mentioned earlier, risk adjusted returns. Well, risk is a product of, of how you think about the world exactly. and what counts as risky and then what kinds of compensation do you need for such exactly. risk and the need for first loss in certain markets to prove to someone or de-risk something for someone is just, it, it's a whole separate conversation on what are we really describing as a risk so that brings me to my question, how do we get local investors to the table in some of these markets around the world that we're talking about and harness these local knowledge capital? This local knowledge capital that you mentioned can get communities voice and local leaders and, and you know, build resilience through thinking through how we show up that aspect of the ecosystem. Uh, this is getting to the practical. We started at the sort of the big meta picture, but <laughs> what needs to change? Like, how can we really identify and get those folks and, and support those folks and understand risk perception and how that relates? Uh, Claudia, maybe we'll start with you with the South African context, and then Jillian, you can share again from some of your other places around the world that you've seen. So, so in, in, in South Africa, again, we have, um, I mean, if, if one thinks about, you know, local capital, we have abundant sources of local capital. We have, uh, you know, again, we're unusual. We have, you know, a, a trillion dollar uh, pension fund industry. We have very, very large listed companies who sit on massive amounts of capital. Um, you know, we have a, a, a massive budget in, in you know, in, in, within government and, and other sources. So, we, so we, we have no shortage of, of capital. What we have is blind spots. And, yeah. and our, our businesses are, are pretty uh, sort of extraordinary in their, in their vastness. And so, you know, whether it's about, um, you know, the, the, the history of, a, of South Africa with apartheid, gender discrimination, or in this particular very narrow case, which is, you know, supporting entrepreneurs who are bright and often young um, and often black, and sometimes too too little of the time, women, um, getting them to get access to these massive buckets of capital is extraordinarily difficult. And so we do things like create attractive um, structures like first loss capital in order to you know make it easier for them to kind of dip their toes in. And if we, in our new venture capital fund, if we were to get even $10 million, in fact, Five million dollars from one of South Africa's pension funds to invest in 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 our new fund. I mean, we'll have a party for a month because it will be such an extraordinary achievement. Um, because once the first one does it, you know, herd mentality kicks in, and then it's like, oh, okay, they did it. So then it's fine. We'll also put five million. Mm -hmm. There's no problem. And ten years later, young black entrepreneurs, young women entrepreneurs will have 20 doors that they can knock at when they want to be able to, you know, to, to, back, to back their businesses. Jillian. Yes. So um, I agree with everything that Claudia has said. And so to, to give the, the sort of the, the, an example from the Caribbean where the exact opposite is true in the sense that it's a, a much smaller market. There is a lot of dry powder sitting in the balance sheets of corporate 
sitting in the balance sheet of financial institutions. And there are some baby steps being made out of debt financing. But we're so far back where in terms of the perception of what financing and SMME means, it's still about collateralized lending to small businesses. It's still about you know, having um, uh, business plan competitions with you know, tiny prizes. And so uh, for the folks at USAID who are working in the Caribbean, please, please just listen to the other regions of the world in terms of what we should be getting access to in your programming for the Caribbean because the crisis in the Caribbean as a result of the pandemic is beyond existential because many of the islands rely 70 to 80 percent for their budgets on tourism. And if we've noticed, there is a huge drop off in tourism uh, dollars and activity. And so uh, there really is a need for thinking about how do we do even the most basic thing in, in, in that part of the world. Uh, on the on the South African side, I think um, you know Claudia just hit the nail on the head in terms of the kinds of things that need to be done. And one other point, I I I can't make a panel discussion or have a panel discussion without speaking about Nigeria. One of the things that we should be watching out for in Nigeria is that there. That let me just quickly update off. And so many of the activities in funds will actually take place by redeployment of that capital that may not, should not have left in the first place. And that is something that is giving me some encouragement as I see the dynamism, particularly in payments and the um, digital landscape in Nigeria. I think that that is one area to watch out for and that there can be some role for DFIs in Nigeria and of course in other parts of the continent as well. So as we near our final minutes together, I know just want some rapid fire responses, a couple of questions um, before we turn it back to Sashi. Uh, so business happens at the speed of trust. I would like your reaction to that statement and thinking about this next phase that we all must be going through in a post-pandemic world, post-racial reckoning in America and around the world, George Floyd's murder triggered demonstrations the world over. What does that mean for trust and accountability as we think about what's next? Um, super fast responses to, to those two questions. This is kind of like, what do we do now? Claudia, maybe we'll go to you. Um, um, Monique, you know, we, we, we expect to be disappointed by our governments, we, uh, uh, and sadly that is the case in so many contexts. Um, what we really would hope for is that, um, that institutions like USAID, other DFIs globally, uh, come to the party in emergency situations with speed, uh, you know, with empathy, in a, in a way that, that actually uh, bridges the gap that's been left by many governments that, for whatever reason, have kind of failed to deliver for, for, their, for their citizens. Thank you. Jillian? What I would say is that we actually invest in trust building. We recognize that if activities take place at the speed of trust, and we also need to disrupt the existing networks, then we invest in trust building because it's not going to happen sort of like manna from heaven. <laughs> and, um, and I think that that is not yet well understood, uh, either by DFIs or commercial um, institutions, simply because it happens implicitly. You know, every you know, good Silicon Valley um, VC talks about you know, having coffees and wherever. That's about trust building. But then when it extends to other parts of the world or even other parts of the U.S., because it is implicit, it is not costed into the investment process. 
So I think um, I think that's important. And um, on the government issue, I think in some parts of the world, the government is the only institution that is actually trusted. And so there is a there is work to do to actually build the capacity and the capability of government because again given the history of the Caribbean um, if government is not involved in supporting SMMEs the mistrust of the kind of comprador capitalists that we have in the Caribbean is so dramatic that the SMMEs would not trust any sort of um, developmental effort if it didn't involve government but the government needs to be uh, made more capable to play that role of facilitation more expertly. Thank you, and I think we'll have Sashi rejoin us at this point. Yeah, thanks, Monique, and um, thank you all for your questions that have been coming in on the chat box, and um, especially thank you to um, Dr. Marcel and Dr. Manning and Monique for your insightful comment. I think there's so much that we can unpack with some of the examples that you provided, but just to, to touch on a couple of questions that came up, and I think they were answered um, actually by both of you um, during the moderated Q&A, but I know people are looking for examples of how we go beyond the structural bottlenecks and examples of how we shift mental models. And so just to say, it's not a clear, straightforward, linear process, right? It's not like A plus B plus C plus D equals shift a mental model. Mm -hmm. However, in one of um, Dr. Marcel's slides, you have a complex system of actors, and it's the relationships between those actors and it's the trust between those actors that eventually slowly starts to shift the mental model. And so where we are seeing our role at USAID in supporting the shift is by working in different parts of those in that ecosystem. Sometimes it might be coming in at a policy level to address government um, oversight or regulation. Sometimes it's providing first loss to enable a fund um, such as Dr. Manning to, to try something bold and innovative. Um, sometimes it's providing actors that are thinking beyond the box, beyond the, the framework of what the financial framework, financial industry might understand and taking a risk and providing them with a platform to test something new out. And I think, Dr. Marcel, you were giving a good example of how you did that when you worked at J.P. Morgan, but we would welcome more of those types of opportunities as we go forward, both here in Washington, but I think in our field missions. And so we have created, I put it into the chat box here, actually, I, I forgot to put the link in, um, but we are putting together a, a, a network of partners that are really there to go beyond traditional development partners and making sure that we can actually um, talk to people like Dr. Marcel and collaborate, right, to, to actually address some of these um, challenges of both the system and then how people are used to thinking in terms of our mental model. So I think the next slide has some of the, the, the links that I had wanted to make sure everyone could share. Um, but also our emails are here so that if you're interested, you can email any one of us directly. Um, here's the partner network um, that you can link into and then ask, and then directly contact either myself or our invest partners to join because I really do invite all of us to think about this. And as um, so well put um, by our poet yesterday, to be the light, to have the courage to take a chance. And, you know, USAID is trying to do that now. We're trying to use our limited dollars to then buy down the risk for innovative actors to come in. And if we, if we lose on something, it's okay. But sometimes the reward is not just measured by, you know, the traditional models of, of finance. So with that, um, I'll let anyone who in the panel who has a few last words, I know we're two minutes over, but we had so much to share and, um, and invite everyone to, to stay in touch with us um, as we have additional um, interesting webinars coming up in both February and March.